Gloria Steinem is here. She is, as you know, a feminist icon, a writer, an inspiration to generations of women and men. She has led an extraordinary life of activism and adventure and writing. My Life on the Road is her first book in more than 20 years. It reflects on her decades of traveling and championing women's rights. In 2013, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. I am pleased to have her back at this table. Welcome. Thank you so much. Is there any award you have not received? Oh, tons, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the Presidential Medal of Freedom yes. uh, depends for its honor on the president you get it from. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I mean, you might I mean, not have been given it by another president. Well, uh, fortunately, I mean, yeah. Henry Hyde, who probably has yeah. damaged more women's lives than any other single Former human being. Former congressman from Illinois. Yes, uh, who was uh, the Hyde Amendment and right. who, right, uh, was, was given a uh, Medal President of Freedom. Medal of Freedom yes. Right, so it meant a lot to me because it came from President Obama. Yes. <laughs> right. um, so how do you think he's doing? Well, you know, I have such respect and empathy for him because he's dealing with an ultra right wing that if they had cancer and he had the cure, they wouldn't accept it. I mean, I've never seen such... That's a nice turn of phrase. Do you believe that? <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. I think the, the hatred is so huge that although it's certainly not the majority of the country at all, you know, it's maybe 20, 30 percent tops, but it has a lot of influence. And I admire him because he is always trying to talk, trying to reach out. Some people would say too much, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's the kind of fault And to some have. people say not enough. They do. Yeah, I don't, some I don't know. I that don't. He, that he did not use the office in, in, in that way of reaching out enough. Well, that, that has to do with the made. social criticism, that he's not a kind yeah, exactly. of a, a guy who drink, part to drinks beer criticism. and plays poker. It's no, a play he, off the notion that Ronald yeah. Reagan and Tip O'Neill would, at the end of the business day, you know, do battle all day and then at night would you know, have a scotch and try to talk about the world. They did. I did. Find it, oh, yeah, that's true. I, you know, I mean, I can imagine Tip O'Neill doing it, yeah. but I can't imagine Ronald Reagan who... Yeah, Chris Matthews wrote a book about <laughs> it. Not because he was obdurate, just because he really didn't care that much about detail, you know. He was always reading off his California Behavioral Institute cards. Well, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, actually, there, there, Reagan has some, some interesting traits in terms of some of the things he, he wrote a lot, you know, he wrote a lot of things, and, and he used to write all those speeches that he, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't, weren't written by someone else. I mean, mm -hmm. you can like them or not, but no, no, give him some was, pride of authorship. He, the most, you have resurrected an ancient memory of the fact <laughs> See, that Ronald Reagan actually, as President of the United States, called me yes. in Paris. Yes. Uh, you know, my office as said... As President. As President. The, uh, my office said, you know, the President... I said, oh, you can make up something better than that. Yeah. No, but it turned out to be true. And he was making calls that arguably should not have been made by a secretary in the White House, and he was making them himself yes. to ask people to do television ads about uh, products, byproducts of the space program that were important on their own. Yes. And so, uh, you know, he was asking me to do one with Charlton Heston, yeah. which... Uh, Would have been hard for you. And, and I did do it. Oh, you did it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, and, because of his support of the NRA, I thought it might have been a Yeah, no, no, no. It was terrible. But right. I called Jesse Jackson and I said, what should we do? He said, no, people like us should really do this because... Anyway, yeah. it was a... So Ronald Reagan reached out to Gloria Steinem. Right. And I kept trying to make him laugh on the phone about yes. how unlikely this was. I could not. He right. had a script and... He was just there and yeah. telling me about this fellow who made Western movies, you'll love him, and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a surrealistic experience. Um, how long did the conversation last? Four or five minutes? Or? Uh, yeah, more than that, probably, yeah. 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 But, I mean, it was, a, it was a minor thing, you know, that he, uh, you know, the people in control were doing policy, and he was making well, you're, you're trivial phone calls. Well, but the... you're an important person, so, I mean, it's natural that... <laughs> no, he was the... making all the phone calls. Yeah, no, I know, but I, I know he's making them all, but I'm saying that to call, you know, A, to, to basically call you, first of all, you're an important person, but secondly, um, you seem to say that the, the purpose was legitimate and laudatory. Yeah. Yes, it was legitimate, but it was problem. extremely minor. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the great scheme of things, it's minor. So let me talk about foreign policy. ISIS, what happened in... 
California. Give me your thoughts mm -hmm. on where we are in well, that. Well, we are still considering foreign policy in a silo and the various uh, other movements also in silos. And so what we are not recognizing is that demonstrably, in a wonderful book called Sex and World Peace, but, you know, demonstrably in, you know, a couple hundred current c countries, the biggest indicator of whether the country will be violent inside itself or whether it will be willing to use military violence against another country is, is actually not poverty, not access to natural resources, not religion or even degree of democracy. It is. It's violence against females. Yeah, and that is absolutely demonstrated. The, more, the, the larger the, the, the level of violence against females, mm -hmm. the more likely the country is... To be violent in every other way, yeah. Because, it, it, not that females are more important than males, no, but that the systems in which, uh, the, we call them patriarchal or whatever, in which reproduction must be controlled, and often doubly controlled in order to maintain racial separation or to re maintain a particular religion. Or the, they, uh, they control the body, they must control the bodies of women. And that means that in our earliest years we see a system in which it is assumed that one group is born to dominate the other. And often this involves, since it's hard to dominate another adult, this also involves violence. And it normalizes violence in other cases. It is the root cause of violence. We've always known this in, in smaller, older societies, that the more polarized the gender roles, the more violent the society. Where are the gender roles less, least polarized? Uh, in the oldest cultures. I mean, in Native American cultures in the Quay and the San in Africa, in the Dalits, uh, or the original Dalits so in India. So there's less gender conflict in the oldest cultures? Yes, absolutely. And in why fact, is that? In fact, the, their languages, by and large, don't even have he and she as gendered pronouns. Hmm. People are people. Now what what are concept. the examples? Give me those countries. Uh, well, the Quay and the San, who, right, are, who right, are the relatives right, right, of right, all of us, that's right, where right, we all right, came right, from. Right, the Native other American, other the Cherokee, for instance, right. in this country, their language does not have he and she. And, and uh, nor a word for nature, because we're not separate from nature. Mm -hmm. right. So the, in, in the, the original cultures uh, in which reproduction was con naturally controlled by women, because it's our health concern, it's our bodies mm -hmm. and so on, uh, there, there were uh, somewhat uh, gender assigned tasks like women might be in charge of agriculture and men might hunt, but they were regarded as equal. And so we did not start uh, with division. We did not, we saw other people as, uh, we, the, the paradigm was a circle, not mm -hmm. a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And we saw human beings as linked rather than ranked. If you had to make one last speech, and the subject was, look how far we've come, and look how far we have to go, mm -hmm. what would you say? Well, to the first question, how far we've come, yes. I would say, we know we're not crazy. We know the system is crazy. This is big. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to how far yes. we have to go, yeah. I, I would say uh, we have a long way to go because we need to stop dividing each other up by labels and thinking... You mean in the culture generally, or women among women, or no, what? No, 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 in the culture generally. Okay. Generally, yeah. we, you know, that, that you and I share more as human beings then separates us because of sex or gender. Absolutely. Way more. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Way more. Yeah. All right. So why do we focus so much on these adjectives that are used to divide us by gender, by race, by class, by caste in India? It's all about controlling reproduction in order to create and control and continue these hierarchical systems. Okay, so, so the answer as to why do we do this, it is to continue 
the hierarchical system. Yes, right, right. And, and you know, you can see when some started. That is, um, there's, there's a wonderful book called Exterminate All the Brutes, which is a line from Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. And it traces the invention of racism to justify colonialism. The, the whole idea of racial separate uh, difference... Justifies colonialism. To, in order to justify colonialism. Yeah. And right. where did that come from? That came from, I'm sure a historian would go crazy with my overgeneralization, but anyway, the, from the institution of, of patriarchal systems in Europe caused overpopulation, caused colonialism to go off and invade other people's mm -hmm. lands and so on and so on. And in order to justify that, you had to say these people are inferior, uh, you know, you're almost doing them a favor by doing them, you know, they can't adapt to the future. There they came can't govern to be, themselves. There came to be all these theories with skull measurements and all kinds of mm -hmm. craziness uh, that, that proved racial inferiority and that were utterly wrong, 100% wrong. So, you know, we we have to undo that and it's not easy because as as the old cultures will tell us it takes four generations to heal one act of violence four generations to heal one act of violence that, that's their that's their cautionary note when they're choosing mm -hmm. if they they may feel they have to be violent out of self-defense but you're way less likely to do it capriciously if you understand that if you normalize it in one generation, then you grow up, you know, because we, we as human beings have this enormous long period of dependency because, you know, what 80% of our brains develop outside in mm -hmm. the mother's body in culture. Right. So the, the good news is that we're adaptable and the species survives, but the bad news is that we're adaptable. So we can come to believe that race is real, that gender is real, that hierarchy is real, that we need to conquer... That they're real divisions. Yeah, that they're real divisions, that we need to conquer nature when, in fact, we are part of nature. Mm. So, the, you know, there's a long way to go. But at least we have a vision of it, and at least we understand that the way we are currently organized only accounts for maybe 5% of human history so where is at the, the most okay. where is and the is not inevitable. So where is the cutting edge of change? Uh, well, hopefully at this table. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we try mightily. <laughs> it's a round table. This is yes, a step we, forward. Exactly right. Okay, right. And no squares are allowed. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, no, I'm know, serious. There, where is the cutting edge well, of I, change? I, the, you know, it, it, it depends what we're actually looking at you know i mean some people would say the web because it is a democratic yeah. network and personalized that skips over uh yeah. the divisions that we're accustomed to yeah but of and course and gender is not identified uh but we have to be cautious about the web because it is also divisive because uh, how many people are literate, how many people have electricity, how many people sure. have access. It's polarizing. It can yeah. be polarizing. And on the other hand, it's liberating not only because it brings to knowledge to an extraordinary... An extraordinary number of people. People who otherwise uh, but don't have. here's the other... We just, you know, it's not that it's not great. It is great, but we have to understand its limitations. And in addition to the fact that it leaves out, uh, you know, millions upon millions of people and polarizes to some extent. It also does not allow us to empathize with each other. We, we can get information from it, and this is great, and we can find each other, and this is great. But to empathize, you need to be present like in this. all five senses, like yeah. at this table. To right. empathize. To empathize. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, I asked my friendly neurologist <laughs> yes, yes, yes. in order your, to... Your to, neurologist or neuroscientist? <laughs> well, both. Yeah. Uh, it, to produce oxytocin, which right. is the, what uh, the yeah. hormone that allows yeah. us to not just know, but to empathize, right. to feel. To, the the hormone we, is called oxytocin, and mm -hmm. it allows us to empathize and feel. Right. And, okay. and when... Can you get that and add to somebody who's not... <laughs> well, feeling it, when, and compassion when, and empathetic. For instance, when when we male or female hold a child and take care of a child, we're flooded with oxytocin. It's yeah. what allows us to bond. 
but mm. it, it, it requires being present with all five senses. Mm. As much as I love books, yes, yes. <laughs> you, you, so, you don't get it from the printed this. in the printed page yeah. on the printed page, and uh, and you don't get it on the screen. You know, I have a dream. Here's my dream. Okay, we should I wanna, have. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a uh, satellite yes. uh, with. Um, Right, right away, you know, with radio programs in every language uh, that can be uh, heard by somebody on the ground with a wind-up radio. You don't even need electricity. Yeah. You don't need to be well, literate. You wind-up computers. Yes, but, it, yeah. well, electricity, yeah, but you right. still need to be literate. Right, right yes. Right, so, so that would be a, a even more democratic this is means of communications. It's yeah. one of my many dreams. So people, right, right, right. <laughs> oh, well, right. tell me more, Miss Dynam. <laughs> You've come to the right place to oh, share your dreams. Tell me more. Okay, yeah. okay. Here's another okay, one. Let's here's see another it. one. Um, <laughs> that all the people who are talking about climate change yes. and global warming, for which I'm very grateful. And most right. of them are in Paris, as we speak. Yes, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, would remember that. The pressure of unwanted population is the f first root, of the f basis of climate change. Now, we, unfortunately, the people in the old days who used to talk about right, the population control. The presence of unwanted people. Yeah, of, the uh, overpopulation. Right. Is, is oh, I see. O overpopulation. Overpopulation, right. 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 Okay. The people it, it, pre the women's movement mm -hmm. who talked about population control. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> talked about it in a racist way, you know, that focused on other countries and, you know, made kind of racial assumptions. And that has given it a kind of third rail aspect. So now we don't talk about the fact um, that there are, what, 8,000 more people on Earth every minute or so, or then there's like, you know, hundreds of millions of women who want desperately because it's a health concern for us mm -hmm. to be able to limit births, but the, it's suppressed by religions and culture and so on, and they cannot do what in old cultures was understood with er herbs and abortifacients and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Were so, you impressed, changing a little bit, were you impressed with, this has to do with male and female, were you impressed with what uh, Mark Zuckerberg has done, taking time off paternity leave, you know, to. Yes. No, no, I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, if someone as prominent and as young as he is and as wealthy totally and as heroic as he is to so many absolutely. people who worship the god of technology. Uh, you no, know, it's, 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 it's great because how men get to be whole people with all their human qualities right. is being raised to raise children or raising children. That's how, how they become how, how, whole people. Give exp okay. Yeah, because the qualities that are wrongly called feminine but are just human are empathy, attention to detail, yeah. patience, flexibility. That's what you need yeah. to raise kids. And men who don't aren't raised in that way get to be hyper masculine. And they and some of them Yeah, some of them. Okay, and some of them, but seriously some of them because of the crime we've just seen in California. Yeah. Some of them create crimes that I would call supremacy crimes. They have no gain nothing. They're not going to gain money when they're domestically violent. They're not going to gain something when they're racist cops. Mm -hmm. They're not g going to gain something when they go into a theater or a post office and just shoot random strangers. It doesn't add anything to their value. No, nothing. And in fact, or anything we, in they a, value. No, and in a lot of cases of, of uh, domestic abuse, they c may kill their family and kill themselves. They are getting absolutely nothing out of it except they have become addicted to control. Mm. They are addicted to saying, you know, powerfully, I can kill you, this is the ultimate proof of my control. And we should call them what they are, which is supremacy crimes. And in this country... I they, have control over your life. Yes, and, and that is hyper-masculinity. They, yeah. they got born into this culture. They didn't make it up. <laughs> but they... Now, but you know they, what the interesting thing is today in... San Bernardino, this is the first time they've begun to see couples. Yes, no, no, I know, and that is the very first time, because up to now, in this country at least, and I think in general, the people who commit these kinds of 
you know, crazed crimes of just killing strangers killers, or right. or their own families or have been like 98 percent, uh, well, 100 percent male up to mm -hmm. now, uh, white and not poor. They are exactly the people who are most likely, in a way, to get hooked into, get hooked on the drug of control, that they're not real men, they're not real people, unless they control others to the degree even and they're controlled of by going acts against of their own. Right, exactly, right, mm. right. Back to nurturing and, and what it does for uh, a male. Um, do you regret not having children? No, not for a millisecond. Not for a millisecond. No, but I was you, raised to have children. I know you were. And so I'm, I'm glad for that. And I wish, uh, you know, men were raised to okay, have children. Okay, but tell me, how do I frame this question to understand why you say not for a millisecond? Mm -hmm. Because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm meaning it in, in the general... No, 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 I understand. Okay. Yeah. No, well, we, you know, as a friend of mine once said, uh, there's no more reason why everybody with a womb should have children. I, I'm, I'm Wait a minute. All that. Wait all a right. minute. Then why everybody with vocal cords should be an opera singer? I understand okay. All that. Yes. It is it is a gift. I know. It's a gift, right? It, it's, it's and a, we nurture in different ways. I understand. Okay. And it's possible that in my case, I'm I'm not sure, but it's possible that in my case that because my mother and I were reversed in our roles to a certain extent that mm -hmm. I was looking after her as a, as a as a young person. And yeah. I, sometimes I was the parent and she was the child. That maybe, you know, that that's yeah. why I feel like I did that. I have no idea, you know, it's, I'm really not sure. I just know I'm happy. One of the things they say is that all of a sudden you realize it's not about you. You, know, you don't have to look at childbearing to feel that way. I mean, you no, ought to feel that and way especially generally. not if you're a female because you're raised for self-sacrifice. Yeah. You're raised, you know, if you say to, to me, what movie do you want to go to? I'm raised to say, I don't know, what movie do you want to go to? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you do, though. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to, but it is. I would think yeah. so. Yeah, but Amy, I mean, I think, well, Amy I mean, I think that's, but isn't that empathy? I think empathy in part is is to say... I'm interested in where you want to go, you mm -hmm. know? To be unable to, to, uh, to feel you shouldn't is it's unfeminine to voice yeah, your opinion exactly, exactly. is, is yeah. a problem. And by and large, women need, I mean, the, the golden rule was written by a very smart guy for guys. <laughs> <laughs> but by and large, women need to reverse it. We need to learn how to treat ourselves as well as we treat other people. Aren't we doing better on that? Yeah, we are. We really because are. Because now at least we can say it. You know, yeah, we're conscious exactly. of it. That's what I mean. We're not crazy. We know we're not crazy. Yeah. This is huge. Why did it take you 18 years to write this? <laughs> because I was doing it every summer <laughs> and then going back on the road. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and yes. actually it got much too long. And yeah. and two wonderful friends of mine, Suzanne Levine, who was the editor of Miss Magazine. Who I know, yes. Uh, right. And mm. Amy Richards took machetes <laughs> and, said, and threatened you and cut it down arm. and cut and, and cut it down but oh, uh, oh you mean the, yeah because it was this was, it was too like, long it was a thousand pages and it they was, cut it down to well no, I don't know, but anyway it was too long 276 um, but and in these days thanks to the web you can put what you cut out on the web so eventually so that's what you did <laughs> no not yet not yet i will oh look here's a picture of you look at this yeah that's a very yeah, typical yeah. picture yeah. right <laughs> Even today. <laughs> but you know, but there's the, the dedication. All right, I'm going to read it, okay? Okay. This book is dedicated to Dr. John Sharp of London, who in 1957, a decade before physicians in England could legally perform an abortion for any reason other than the health of the woman, took the considerable risk of referring for an abortion a 22-year-old American on her way to India, knowing only that she had broken an engagement at home to seek an unknown fate, he said, you must promise me two things. First, you will not tell anyone my name. Second, you will do what you want to do with your life. This is powerful. Mm -hmm. Dear Dr. Sharp, I believe you, who knew the law was unjust, would not mind if I say this so long after your death. I've done the best I could. With my life. With my life. Right. This book is for you. This right. book is for you. Mm -hmm. Good for you. <laughs> No, I'm gladder every day that I dedicated it that way. Right. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Gloria Steinem, the book is called My Life on the Road. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.
For more about this program and early episodes, visit us online at people.